Um, my name is Jonathan Kimler. I'm presenting some work with uh, my colleagues uh, Adam Ramey and Gary Hollibaugh. Uh, for this particular session, we're going to go on a, uh, a trip uh, back one year to 2013 with the uh, federal government shutdown. Um, Senator Coburn, uh, who voted to uh, bring about cloture to end the 2013 government shutdown, uh, nevertheless uh, was very strong uh, in his position uh, that, uh, that the health care uh, initiative should be uh, paired back and supported the goals of the shutdown, uh, even though he voted for cloture, while uh, Senator Pat Toomey also had very strong positions on government spending and, uh, and, and expenditures to implement uh, Obamacare. Uh, but he uh, voted against closure to, uh, to end the shutdown. So we have uh, a plot here of Democrats and Republicans' votes on whether they wanted to end or the shutdown or keep it going. All the Democrats voted to end the shutdown. Republicans were split. But there's a lot of overlap in terms of nominate scores among the Republicans who voted to end the shutdown, the ones who voted to keep it keep it going, uh, keep that car going towards the cliff. Um, uh, but uh, there's an interest. So there's there's some lack of uh, explanatory power on the part of, uh, of at least one measure of ideology to explain this this decision. Uh, and and I, I think there's an interesting quote here by Speaker Boehner. Uh, he said that he supported the goals of the shutdown. He thought it was it was a good thing to try to hold back implementation of the Affordable Care Act, but he didn't think it was tactically the right thing to do. He thought there were better procedures that could be done to pursue this policy end. So uh, politicians often have shared policy goals, but they differ uh, as to uh, what the best way is to go about pursuing those policy ends. Uh, so. Our argument, we typically assume that uh, legislator behavior is uh, sort of an offshoot or, or derived from uh, individual preferences over policy. Um, however, in order to pursue policy ends, legislators have to pick uh, implementation uh, vehicles to put those policies uh, into action to implement them. And these policy uh, these processes, these, these procedures, have their own qualities on which individuals can have differing preferences in themselves. Uh, some, some vehicles, some bills can be riskier than others. Some can be more cooperative or more aggressive. Uh, so we argue that individual differences that are identified by decision theory uh, drive these evaluations. These are things like risk preferences, preferences for delay, uh, altruism, social preferences of various types, and the structures that individuals have uh, in the, their beliefs about the world. Uh, so experimental econ and, and, and personality psychologists in the lab have recently found some interesting connections uh, between at least the five-factor model of personality and some of these important decision theoretic um, parameters. So what we do in this project is we use a support vector machines algorithm to estimate the uh, personality traits of members of the United States Congress based on their speeches that they make uh, on the floor of the, of the House and Senate. So uh, here, we characterize, well, we'll talk about this more, but we characterize openness to experience, which is one of the five uh, personality traits in the big five in the five-factor model. We, we characterize openness to experience as being uh, equivalent or, or picking up uh, low risk aversion. And in the meat of the distribution of, uh, of the Republican conference, there's a big difference. I mean, right, you, you see that members who are low on openness and thus uh, more risk averse are much more likely to vote to keep the shutdown or to end the shutdown and to keep it going. So the members who are of high openness, who are more risk tolerant, are more likely to vote to keep the, uh, the shutdown going. So that's a little taste uh, of, of what's to come. Uh, so uh, our contribution is to bring together three different literatures. Uh, there are, there's this work with experimental income that I alluded to earlier that combines, uh, or that finds linkages between personality traits and these decision theoretic 
important parameters. Uh, there's the estimation of uh, personality traits through the texts that are available from elites. And then there's a larger project that we're, I mean, the goal of this over time, uh, there's a lot more work to do, is to build an empirical and theoretical framework that allows us to think about the individual differences of elites and how that influences uh, institutions. So, um, a little bit about the big five. Uh, the big five are derived from lexical content analysis, uh, a factor analysis of what the words that, that people use. It's, it's been around for a long time. Um, it's, uh, it's the gold standard of personality measures, even though there's a lot of, there are a lot of people who would disagree with that statement. That's fine. We're using them as noisy proxies for these decision theoretic parameters that we're interested in. Uh, so we're not wedded to the big five as the perfect model of personality, but for now, it's useful until we get better measures. Um, but the, the big five uh, include these five um, traits, uh, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Uh, don't get too... I don't get too hung up on what, if you're not familiar with the Big Five, as to uh, what exactly, I mean, if conscientiousness works the same way as you're familiar with it in common language, a lot of people actually just stick with using the first initial of these traits so they don't read too much uh, into a particular label for these, for these dimensions of personality. Uh, so we argue that these, these trait measures pick up clusters of related uh, preferences, uh, skills and beliefs, and the causes vary where agnostic as to whether this is biological or potent potentially self-inflicted. Uh, uh, you might have reasons for lying to yourself to uh, believe the world or your, your, your potential outcomes are better than they'll be. Um, so we, we stay away from that from the, for this project. Uh, so we'll get into uh, a little bit of the, the literature as to what these traits are associated with. Uh, openness has been found to be associated with uh, reveal preferences for riskier lotteries. So you can think about openness as being uh, a noisy measure of, uh, of risk preferences and, and risk seeking. Uh, conscientiousness has been found to be associated with lower levels of discounting of the future. Um, and extroversion has been associated uh, in, in the lab uh, with uh, more discounting of the future, so extroverts tend to be more eager to uh, seek quick payoffs rather than invest long term. And they also tend to have biased expectations of their own uh, payoffs in situations that are not dependent on their own actions. So they just think good things happen to them uh, in the lab. Uh, agreeableness has been associated with uh, larger amounts of, of trust as measured in dictator games, um, uh, higher levels of, uh, or lower levels of punishment of defectors in, in reciprocity situations. Uh, and neuroticism is associated with preferring less risky lotteries, so neuroticism picks up some degree of uh, risk aversion. But also neuroticism is associated with what's known as external locus of control, uh, the belief that the actions one takes is not or do not uh, affect the outcomes that a person experiences. So, uh, for example, one, one minor finding we've found is that uh, neurotics tend to put much more weight on star signs uh, controlling their outcomes. Uh, so that's, we, we argue that that's associated with noisier signals individuals receive about the world. Uh, and if you're familiar with the uh, clonal response, it could be related with uh, heterogeneous uh, lambdas, which is something else that we won't get into in this presentation. But for now, I'll distract you with a picture of a cute animal, and I will pass this off to, uh, to Adam, who will continue the presentation. Thank you. Can every, everyone can hear me. I, the mic is probably overkill. So, um, so this is a gazelle. It's a baby gazelle. Um, and it's up here uh, not just to show a cute animal, but uh, so I'm in Abu Dhabi, and Abu Dhabi in Arabic means father of the gazelle. So there you go. You learned something other than text stuff uh, over the, uh, the last two days. So, as Jonathan was saying, so, you know, this project sort of has two aims, and the, the first aim is kind of theoretical, and the other is, is empirical. 
And Jonathan kind of laid out some of the theory that exists about the role of personality traits and in 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 uh, in how uh, it affects behavior and sort of uh, recent uh, developments in in the experimental literature that have found linkages between stuff that economists typically care about and stuff that psychologists typically care about. And that's all well and good, but then if we can't actually measure these things, then then it's then it's kind of a non-starter for on an empirical uh, from an empirical standpoint. So, and, and we're particularly interested in measuring these for elites. So in the lab, it's actually not a hard thing to do. Psych psychologists have come up with many different inventories to measure the big five and various other uh, models of personality uh, as well. But of course, almost every single one of those is uh, a survey-based measure. And first of all, legislators don't respond to surveys. And second of all, even if they did, we have no reason to believe that they would be truthful. Um, a recent paper in political psychology, Jeff Mondak, uh, who's done a lot of work in political psych in this literature, um, did a survey of some state legislators, got really low response rate, and not surprisingly, everybody, uh, like not over in excess of 93% of respondents gave the positive answer to every single one of the personality questions. So, so, so we basically surveys are out. So how are we going to do it? And the part that's relevant to this conference is we're going to use text. And so I'll give you a brief overview of sort of the, the, the procedure that we're going to use, and then I'll kind of give you some justifications, some intuitions as to why, why this, this works. So what we're going to do is we're going to take speeches from members of Congress from, from 96 to 2013. Why that period? That's the period that's digitized. We're working on, uh, on doing OCR with, with, with the record going back in time. Um, so we're going to run floor speeches uh, from this time period through uh, Pettibaker's Linguistic Inventory and Word Count, uh, I'm going to call it the LIWC. I've heard it's also pronounced Lick. I, Luke. I'm Luke. 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 <laughs> Luke. Okay, maybe I'll call it Luke today. Uh, so, uh, so, so, um, uh, I'll talk about what the LIWC is in a minute. But it's 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 a dictionary-based method where we process text into a series of psycholinguistic categories. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use um, sort of this method that that uh, Francois Mares and colleagues uh, had had have used. Uh, uh, to basically take texts that were written, composed by subjects in a lab to train a series of, of, of models to predict their personality. So basically these, these lab, exper uh, lab participants uh, get sort of the traditional personality inventories. Uh, they're also uh, uh, expected to write some short narratives for about 15 minutes. And then they, they train the models on those responses. And there's somewhere around 3,000 participants that, that have done that. And we're actually doing some extensive work now. We've, we've teamed up with some psychologists uh, in, in Cambridge. And we're working, doing this on a large scale with 3.5 million Facebook users. So we're, we're trying to, to, to extend this uh, going forward. But uh, you know, so, so we do a simple uh, uh, support vector machine for linear regression, SMORIG. Um, why it outperformed uh, various other approaches. Uh, and so basically, we take the model that was trained on the, in the lab. And then we use it to essentially out of sample predict uh, for the legislators. And again, we'll talk about why that, that is probably not as crazy as you might think. Um, and, uh, and then last but not least, there's issues about the comparability of discourse over time and, and so on. So we use this uh, technique that Gross, Close, Steiner, and Levitt used to adjust uh, legislator uh, ideology estimates over time. But it turns out this, this in, in, empirically doesn't turn out to make a difference one way or the other. So let me talk a little bit why, to, uh, sort of give you intuition, why does this work? So Pennebaker and King, so Pennebaker is at Texas, I believe, and he's, done, he's a psychologist. He's done a lot of work on the connections between language use and psychological profiles. Um, he developed this, this, the, this Luke software um, that, that sort of maps uh, words into a series of categories. And depending on which version of the software you use, what, what language uh, you use it in, because there's, I think, seven or eight different language options. And so on, there's, there's somewhere between 64 and 88 total categories of words. And this is important because we're counting categories, not specific words. And obviously, legislative speech is highly specific, right? They're talking about uh, 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 funding for uh, schools in Alabama. They're not, they're not talking about uh, describing empty soda bottles uh, in a lab, right? But, but again, we're not counting the words. We don't care about the words themselves. We care about which psycholinguistic categories those words fall into. And I'll show you some evidence to, to show that basically the lab participants and, and, and Congress members, in terms of the, 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 the categories of words that they use, are not terribly different uh, in the aggregate. Now, obviously, there's some potential objections here. One is that um, we're measuring speechwriter and not legislator personality, right? So floor speeches are not always written by 
the members of Congress themselves. Sometimes they do, sometimes they ad lib, but very frequently they have pre-written pre statements and, and they, they add modifications of their own. So maybe we're measuring uh, speechwriter, if not legislative personality. So that's, that's, that's one potential objection. Um, well, we're not terribly worried about this for a few reasons. First of all, even if this is true, there's tremendous stability in the estimates over time. So even if legislators aren't writing these things, their staff, they're working close with them to portray sort of a strategic profile that's consistent over time. Right? And that's another thing that's as well. We, we consider these just as nominate scores or revealed preferences. These are revealed personality traits. In some sense, we don't care if they are the actual personality traits of the legislators. Okay? So that's fine. Another thing is personality might just be ideology. There's been a lot of work in political psychology that's shown that the big five do have significant correlations with individuals' liberal conservative self-placement. Um, that may be an issue, right? And so the good news is we replicate the correlations that are found in that literature with our measures. Uh, uh, but the additional good news is that the, the uh, explanatory power uh, uh, is like, you know, the R squares are at something like 0.05. Right? So there's a correlation, and it's significant, but it's not explaining everything. So, so that's good. Um, of course, there's this problem where, well, legislators might want to incentive, have an incentive to mimic desirable traits. Like, nobody wants to come across as neurotic. Um, we believe this isn't as big of an issue in the sense that, uh, well, it's harder to game speech. Right? I doubt that um, legislators know that the number of affective words that they use says something about their neuroticism, for example. And then last, right, so... I, I kind of already alluded to this, lab participant language might be different from Congress, and I'll show you some evidence in a second to kind of to put that aside. So just, I'm not going to go through this, it's a kind of a really big table, but just to give you an idea of like sort of how the, how, how Luke works, right, so there's all these different categories of, wor uh, of words, some of them are just simple things like sorts of pronouns, first person, second person, third person, auxiliary verbs, common verbs, present tense, future tense, so on and so forth, and there's lots of different words in each of these categories. So, for example, one of the categories is called six-letter words. It's words that are six letters or longer. And sure enough, it, it turns out that six-letter words are correlated with introversion, right? People who use big words are typically not extroverted, right? So there's sort of intuition there. And, you know, similarly, uh, this table keeps going. Um, so, you know, there's a category about tentative. And as you might imagine, words that fall into that category are words like maybe, perhaps, yes. They're words that, that indicate some sort of uncertainty. And then, you know, it's going to be hard for you to see, but sort of the, what I have here is sort of the uh, big five traits uh, on, on the left side of both of these, and I have the, L, the Luke categories uh, on the x-axis, and then I have the correlations between the left participants' Luke proportions and their, 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 their scores on these, and you see that there's sort of huge patterns of correlation all over the place. So, you know, extroverts like to talk a lot, so they use all of these, they use sexuality terms, body terms, social processes, whatever. Uh, extroverts do not like to talk about numbers, right? Again, they're, 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 they're the outgoing Gregorius party types and so on. Uh, and you'll notice that openness kind of has a negative correlation with almost everything, and part of that is driven by the fact that openness as one of the five factors is the weakest factor in, in the five-factor personality model. So what I have here is uh, using the, the, the even larger data, but you know, I could have used this for the, 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 the Pennebaker data. This is sort of the, the data from 150,000 Facebook users. Uh, this is based on their status updates. These are the Luke tags. And this is the, the, uh, the, the same tags for members of Congress from their speeches of 112. And as you can see, right, the correlation is like 0.92. The average difference in terms of usage of a particular uh, Luke category is maybe about like less than 1%. So, so these are really close. So let me just give you one quick example um, to sort of, uh, to, to especially for the non-political sciences in the audience, to see how this works. Right, so we have... 80s rock, right? We've got Bon Jovi. It's flamboyant. It's out there. It's in your face. It's about having fun, having a good time. We've got 90s, sort of the Seattle scene. It's, it's this introverted, introspective thing. So let's run a couple of the, let's, let's run the Bon, bon Jovi, so you give love a bad name. Nirvana, small like teen spirit through Luke. What do we see? These are the top categories for, for each of the two songs, right? Not surprisingly, you give love a bad name. It's talking a lot about social stuff. A lot of references to the present tense, active, uh, um, affective words, positive emotions, relatively few six-letter words. Smells like Teen Spirit, the largest category right there, six-letter words, a lot of pronouns, right? A lot of commas actually present, right? Complex thoughts and so on. And then we run this through the algorithm, and what do we find out? We find out that Bon Jovi's way more extroverted than, than Nirvana. 
uh, way more emotionally stable than Nirvana. And so, <laughs> hey, caveat after this is one song, okay? So, here's an example from, uh, for, so Ken gave the presentation on Pointita yesterday, so I took the presidential inaugural uh, address uh, corpus, and I ran this through Luke, and, and we can see sort of trends in, in, in usage uh, uh, over time. We can do Luke as well. We have his program. It's, you do? Oh, that's fantastic. Okay. I th there are copyright issues. Never mind. This is the first he's hearing of it. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, Fair yeah, yeah. So, 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 so here are the sort of the, the loop trends over time with the different categories, and there's a structural break right here in 1877, the end of Reconstruction. So we see much more references to we, much fewer references to I, a lot more references to social things into the present tense, and not so much about the future. Okay, I'm running low on time, so let's let's talk about sort of like we run this through Congress, and then now what are we going to do with it? Okay, so here are some aggregate trends to put things into, into, to, to, um, into perspective. We have the big five, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, conscientiousness, emotional stability over time. And I also for, for, uh, put a measure of polarization based on adjusted ADA scores. Why not nominate? Well, I wanted yearly measures. It doesn't make a difference what, which way you go. But sure enough, you know, sort of in, in this, it passes the smell test. Polarization is going up. Openness is going down. Agreeableness is generally going down. Conscientiousness is going down. Somewhat paradoxically, emotional stability is going up, but that's because emotional stability is not what it might be, what you might think it might be in a colloquial sense. Uh, extroversion is definitely going up. And in the Senate, the drop in agreeableness is actually, this is for the House, is actually more stark. Okay? All right. So, really quickly, why do we care about this? Because, well, legislators do lots of stuff. So, for example, one of the big things they do is they propose and they pass legislation. So, let's take our measures. Let's control for all the usual things that political scientists care about, and let's see if they actually matter. I'm not even going to have time to go through the hypotheses because we're running out of time, so I'm just going to go to pictures. So this is a, a result from a, 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 a Poisson mixed effects model uh, or where we're predicting the predicted number of bills proposed by a member of Congress. We've got ideology controls, district controls, all the usual kind of stuff. And what we're doing here is we're, we're varying their extroversion and breaking down their ideological extremism here. Right, which is like the absolute value of their nominate score, based on whether they're centrist in the mainstream or they're extremists. And sure enough, especially for centrists, there's a sort of there's a positive effect for everybody. But there's sort of the skyrocketing uh, effect in terms of the predicted number of bills proposed. Uh, ceremonial bills, like bills to name post offices after people, right? Stuff that's not actually uh, really meaningful, right? Conscientious people, people are hardworking, want to do a good job, should not want to be doing this kind of silly. Uh, kind of pandering stuff, and sure enough, there's a negative effect as conscientiousness goes up. The probability of, of, of the proportion of those bills goes down, uh, and it, it's irrespective of whether you're in the minority or the majority party. Co-sponsorship, right? Agreeable people like to co-sponsor, right? The most agreeable people, no matter how competitive their district is, like to co-sponsor with members of the opposite party a lot. But the least agreeable people, once you get away from the most competitive districts, do not like to co-sponsor across the aisle at all. Okay. Okay. Quick preview. What's more, what? What? What can we? What else can we do? We can predict legislator effectiveness. This is the Volden and Wiseman legislator effectiveness scores. More conscientious members of the majority are much more effective. Who misses votes? Again, after controlling for personal factors. Conscientious people do not like to miss roll call votes. They like to, they're registered, they like to do a good job. Conscientiousness goes up, absences go down. Okay, so what did we do? We have a theory, right? We have the first measures of big five for members of Congress over time. We've shown empirical support for how these are associated with legislative behavior. And we actually found, as you probably noticed by a lot of those different graphs, we actually find this really interesting interactive effect between ideology and personality, which to, no one has really found to date. And so we're kind of exploring that. We're writing a book about this. Um, we're also looking, uh, uh, we have a, we've looked at a much wider range of behavior, including fundraising, issue focus, and death in office. We can actually predict death in office, emotional stability, right? So the most neurotic people actually die in Congress. And we have this beautiful graph of Henry Hyde's predicted probability of dying in office every year. And it just goes up and up and up and up and up and up, and then he dies. Um, uh, we have to theoretically explain why ideology has this mitigating role, right? We found the effect, but we don't really know why. We want to bring voters into the picture, and we also, particularly for neuroticism, uh, we want to help. We want to do some lab experiments to actually help microfound a little bit more the, the, the connections with 
locus of control and uncertainty and neuroticism. And that is it. Thank you.